diesel engine. It's 16 feet long, 6 feet high, 6 feet wide. And the big numbers spill over into the interior as well. I wish someone would explain to the Japanese that we don't measure luxury by how many buttons there are. I've got two for the differential locks, two for the electric aerial, two for the sunshine roof. I must say that when this car rolled up I was determined to hate it. It's big and brash with its white letter tyres and tacky upholstery. Sort of automotive equivalent of a pair of white socks. Get the impression if you turned up for a day's shooting the pheasants would die laughing. But I've done a couple of hundred miles in it now and I'm, I'm getting really rather fond of it. It has an earthy feel about it, which I like. It has a reasonable turn of speed and it handles with great adroitness for such a leviathan. The steering's a vast improvement over the old model and so driving it on normal roads is by no means unpleasant. Even so, you're constantly aware that no matter how much it pretends to be a Jaguar, its abilities are more in line with those of a tractor. Well, I wouldn't like to have to do this in a miniskirt. Not that I've got a miniskirt, you understand. Now, the Mercedes is the other way around. The hideous exterior looks might lead you to think that it's a tractor, but the innards, well, they suggest otherwise. I know these pale colours are all very well for people, but I think the sheep might muck it up a bit. As opposed to the Toyota, which in its latest form is only imported as an eight-seater diesel, you can have the G-Wagon as a long or short wheelbase with petrol or diesel power. A word of warning, though, it's impossible to fit a turbocharger to right-hand drive diesel models, and that makes them, well, let's be kind, let's say sluggish. Now, the petrol engines are much better. This is a three-litre six, and as you'd imagine, it's smooth and quiet and refined and blessed with perfectly reasonable levels of performance. As before, there are locking differentials and low-ratio gears, but the new versions now have full-time four-wheel drive and better suspension. It looks the same, though. The biggest change, superficially at least, is in here. All of these trim pieces appear to have been taken from 50 or 60,000 pound Mercedes saloons. And of course gives an immense feeling of quality and of course it's all beautifully screwed together. Now the thing is, is that when you're in any Mercedes from the smallest 190 up to the biggest coupe, you can't help, metaphorically, looking down on other motorists. When you're in a G-Wagon, you're actually looking down on them. If you want to buy one of these to use primarily as a road car, fine. They both offer a load of advantages over, say, a Jaguar Saloon. You sit up high, that gives you a great view of the road, there's tons of space, they're great for towing, and of course the weather can do pretty much what it wants and you'll still be mobile. Disadvantages, well, they're not exactly aerodynamic, so the fuel bills are pretty big, and the suspension is designed for off-road use and it makes it a bit bouncy on the road. Now, choosing between the Mercedes and the Toyota is more difficult. Although they're designed to do the same job, they both differ in terms of style, so really it's a personal choice. And anyway, they both have a big, big problem. The Range Rover is warming up for its 21st birthday this summer, but even so, in terms of sales, in Britain at least, it knocks the competition into a cocked hat. Not only is it more stylish, you can see the Queen turning up in one, for instance, but it's more elegant in here too, all the wood and leather, combines with all the latest toys, the automatic dipping rear view mirror, the electric seats and so on. And of course, this is the only one here to have a V8 engine. And now for 1991 comes another big change. Land Rover have fitted anti-roll bars. Wow! No, honestly, it's big news. In the past, if a dog or a chicken or something ran out into the road and you had to take avoiding action, early Range Rovers used to roll around and give the impression they weren't really going to change direction at all. Well, this new model handles much, much better. And Land Rovers say the new roll bars haven't affected its wheel articulation, something that's made the Range Rover so good off-road in the past. As far as I can work out, they haven't harmed ride comfort either. Be in no doubt that the Range Rover is the best off-roader you can buy, even at £34,000 for this Vogue SE. The Land Cruiser is £7,000 less, while a similarly equipped G-Wagon is a staggering £10,000 more. Hardly surprising people don't take them off-road. We did, though.
Not so long ago, the Range Rover led its competition by about, oh, by about that much. But as we've seen, off-road and on it, the gap's getting quite narrow now. It must be down to about, oh, about that, I should say. Now, back here at the Motor Show, you don't get many new Bentleys to the decade, so this is a somewhat uh, privileged event, the launch of the new Bentley Continental Coupe for the 1990s. Let me get the figures out of the way straight away. It's slightly longer, slightly lower than the Turbo R. It weighs two and a half tons, and the muscular 6.75 litre engine can get this monster up to 60 in 6.6 .6 seconds. Oh, yes, and they're claiming it's a full four-seater. Now, the design brief was for a sculpted look, and the result of these go faster bulges, if you like, that run right down the side panels of the car, flaring out of the rear wings, ending up in these gouges cut out of the top of the boot. Have they improved the appearance? Well, I think the jury is still out on that. Now, inside, apart from the inevitable hand-picked hide and polished walnut, the big change is the central console, which runs from the face here right the way through the rear seats. Price tag £160,000, complete with number plates, of course, but the bad news is it's a limited edition. Only 300 planned for 1992, so don't delay while stocks last. Now over to Sue, who's next door on the Jaguar stand. I rate this one of the best looking cars in the show, and it's 30 years old. Jaguar's E-Type was launched at the Geneva Motor Show in 1961. Price, £2,200, although they charge you £60 extra for the wire wheels. It caused a sensation then, and it's still been attracting crowds today. And by modern standards, its performance is respectable. A 3.8-litre six-cylinder engine gives it a top speed of 150 miles an hour, and it'll do 0 to 60 in seven seconds. Now, I wonder how many of today's new cars are going to age as well as this one. Well, that's about it for this week. If we've whetted your appetite, we will be having later in the series full road test reports on the Citroen, the Shogun, the BMW 3 Series, and that marvellous new Mercedes S-Class. Now, next week, we have a report on the historic RAC rally from the west with uh, my mate Tony Mason joining his old mate Roger Clark in car number one. We have a road test on the Proton from Malaysia, which has recently received a Watt Car Best Value Award, and we look at the value of company cars. Until then, it's goodbye from Sue and myself in Geneva. Cheerio.